Welcome to our webinar today. Um, we are talking about quick build projects moving from COVID-19 response to recovery. Before we dive in, I just wanted to do a uh, quick plug for another webinar we have coming up on a similar topic. Um, we're hosting an Ask Me Anything with former US DOT Deputy Secretary John Percari, a good friend of mine, and um, a former US DOT policy aide, Sahar Shirazi, another great friend, on positioning projects for recovery funds. Um, they were involved with Tiger under Obama and have a lot to share um, to help many of you DOT um, folks on the on the on the call um, and so that's offered through our online slack community for transportation professionals called transpo talk and kate is going to drop a link in the chat um, for those of you who uh, want to hear more about that Oops. sorry okay so I'm in a previous, having a little bit of a slide issue. All right, so why are we here? In April of 2020, we noticed Remix customers' uh, concept designs with names like Shared Street and COVID-19 Planning. These maps differed from those that came before them, opting for traffic barricades over paint, like this one in Montgomery County, for example. And then in May, when many states began to reopen after shelter in place period, we saw an uptick like, of maps like this one from New Orleans uh, that had spatial references around cafe, cafe tables um, and pedestrians. And we saw maps such as this one from Santa Monica depicting uh, expanded pickup and drop off areas as well as more dining space which they're using to collaborate with local business improvement districts and neighborhood groups uh, to finalize plans for quick build implementation. And this is about the same time this panel came together. And then on May 25th, George Floyd was murdered. In the last two weeks, there have been protests in all 50 states demanding justice, once again, bringing to light the lack of safety black folks experience in the street. When I got these panelists on the phone, we all agreed we could not talk about recovery without acknowledging that the impact of COVID-19 is not equally shared. Our black community members are dying at three times the rate of white people and white um, unemployment fell to 12.4% on May in May from 12.2% the previous month, while black unemployment rate rose to 16.8% from 16.7%. Any successful recovery planning process must keep this fact central. And this group will dive into what that means for those of us implementing quick build projects. We've pulled together a really special group of people for you with deep but varied expertise. Emiko Atherton is here from Complete Streets Coalition, a program of Smart Growth America. Smart Growth America works in partnership with governors, DOTs, and transportation providers to advance their goals by helping government get out of its own way. <laughs> Emiko will give us a quick refresher on Complete Streets and Complete Streets actions during COVID-19 across the project uh, country. Mike Leiden is a founding principal of Street Plans and the co-author of Tactical Urbanism, which Planet is in named one of the top planning books of the past decade. They also named Mike as one of the 100 most influential urbanists. Most recently, Mike co-authored NACTO's Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery, an emerging best practice guide that aims to assist cities managing the myriad of challenges stemming from COVID-19 pandemic. Kate is gonna drop a link to this guide in the chat for those who haven't got a chance to find it yet. And then we also have Warren Logan. Uh, speaking of the myriad of challenges stemming from COVID-19 pandemic, uh, he is an expert at implementing these projects. He is the City of Oakland's Policy Director of Mobility and Interagency Relations. He played a key role in the mayor's initiative to open 74 miles of slow streets and is continuing to play a central role coordinating with the city's Department of Transportation, Public Works, and other Bay Area public agencies to roll out new street space programs that address social distancing and economic recovery. 
The mayor's office is and has been putting equity first in their planning work and Warren will help us understand what that means and the, the challenges that come from moving projects forward quickly while keeping open lines of communication um, with the community. So together, this team has the funding, design, and implementation expertise to help each of you utilize quick build tactics in this road to recovery ahead. Today's agenda is 15 minutes of short presentations from our panelists just to ground us in their expertise, and then we'll move into a discussion and Q&A. Please feel free to drop questions into Q&A as they come up. We'll definitely be sure, I'm gonna be moving really fast. You probably saw me move really fast in our, in our opening here because I think it's important that you guys on, on the line get access to these experts. So our first uh, speaker today will be Emiko. Um, if you wanna unmute yourself, I will be advancing the slide. So just let me know when you need me to. Thanks so much, Rachel, uh, and good afternoon or good morning, all of you. Uh, could you move to the next slide? As Rachel said, my name is Emiko Atherton, and I am the director of the National Complete Streets Coalition. Uh, and what I wanted to do today is really set up the discussion and really Mike and Warren's comments in the context of what we've been seeing um, both nationally and internationally. So next slide. And to do that, I wanted to really talk about complete streets, which I'm going to guess that almost, if not everyone on this call is familiar with the term. Um, but I wanted to really catch it in the way that, that we define it at the coalition, um, because I think it's, it's relevant not just to the quick builds, but to the larger conversations about race and public space. Uh, we look at complete streets, and I really believe this is not just about building one multimodal street that you can see um, on the left hand side of your screen, but this idea that you're really building a network and that you're building a network that you can get from your origin to your destination in a safe, reliable, affordable, convenient way in a reasonable amount of time, which, you know, needs, it almost needs not saying uh, to those of you on the call is not true for people. Uh, but what we really do at the coalition, and it's embedded into um, both what we uphold as a ideal policy, but also in all of our strategic internal and external plans is, um, is a focus on really justice and, and putting communities that have historically been cut off from opportunity and specifically transportation infrastructure because of racist policies. And that's something that we really feel is important is it's not again about building one great street, but it's about building those networks and networks of opportunity. And it could be building safe access to a transit stop, but really at the end of the day, next slide. Uh, it looks like a bunch of different forms and this this takes place. So we saw in one example, it might be a protected bike lane. This is actually an example of a safe routes project that we worked on. It's a tactical urbanism project that the Complete Streets Coalition worked with the Pittsburgh School District and Department of Health and the Pittsburgh Department of Mobility and Infrastructure last year to implement. Next slide. Um, but often it really is, like I mentioned, access to transit. Uh, this is an arterial state road in Nashville, Tennessee, and you can see a uh, popular uh, transit stop, one of the most visited transit stops, and no safe access to get there. Next slide. So again, it's about building uh, those networks of connectivity. Next slide. Uh, and we really look at it as a process. And, and this is one of the things that I wanted uh, to emphasize within all of this is it is about building those networks, but again, it's not just about the infrastructure, but it's how you approach the transportation planning process. That it really begins, it doesn't start at 30% design, um, but it begins as you start to really pick the transportation projects you're going to build um, <clears throat> and not just get input on the project itself, but really what the community see um, as responding to their needs. Um, and community engagement um, and really community power is a huge part of what we consider complete streets. Next slide. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work on tactical urbanism for the past couple of years or quick builds leading up to COVID-19. And a lot of this focused on both engagement and education. This is a project that we worked with um, the city of South Bend to implement a few years ago. And this was really, this was a traffic calming project, but it was developed um, through community input. And one of the things the community really wanted to see is education to drivers as part of this. So a lot of this, um, as well as some placemaking that happened was through these sandwich boards and a way to really start to articulate to drivers why this was happening. Next slide. Uh, but also getting to changing behavior through design. This is a project we worked with the city of Orlando to implement a few years ago, another quick build, um, where we just worked on a mid-block crossing. This is a road called Curry Ford Road. It's one of the most dangerous streets in the most dangerous place to walk in the country uh, for pedestrians, particularly people of color. Uh, again, this is the Orlando area. Next slide. Uh, and again, I'm bringing this up, but, but really these basic interventions to create access. Next slide. Um, so what we've seen through COVID is I think uh, we saw the coalition, like many of you, some very quick responses. Uh, this is a map, that, a crowdsource map that we host on our website uh, titled Complete Streets Responses to COVID-19. Uh, this is all from information people have sent us and it's a way to visualize what we see is going on, not just in the United States, um, but really throughout North America and South America. You can go on to this and see, and we kind of immediately saw things having to do with open streets, but also um, one of the most populated categories was legislation to make sure bicycle, uh, bicycle shops were open uh, to modify transit operations, but again, open streets, curbside management, actions, and micro-mobility. Uh, I'm going to leave, leave the slide up for a while and talk about, you know, what we saw was kind of this, um, this instant challenge of the status quo. Um, I think, you know, that, that government has the transportation planning takes a really long time. Um, you know, we were able to, not we, I'd say people like Warren, uh, were able to really implement overnight changes that the community had been asked for for a really long time. I think, you know, what we've seen and, and really how race intersects with all of this and, and where we've seen a lot of conflict is um, what's happening, why it's happening, and who it's happening for. And I think those are questions uh, to ask when we're thinking about quick builds and responses to COVID-19. I think the initial response was really to focus on physical distancing and providing people for rec, uh, you know, spaces for people to recreate, which in and of itself is important, but ignoring really, I think, issues of access and so many people who are without a car and need to be able to still continue to get around. Um, it also gets to the, the point around engagement and the process, how many of things these are happening um, kind of with or without community engagement and really where are these happening? And, you know, I don't have like a right or wrong uh, how to do this, but I think these are all considerations and we're going to hear more from Mike and Warren on this about why this is so complicated and why race is really at the center of all of this. Um, you know, in many cities we saw, um, and I, you know, I'd say Warren, uh, Warren did an excellent job in Oakland, uh, but many cities you, we instantly saw, and Atlanta is an example of a city that really the quick builds were going to go in the wealthier white neighborhoods first. And there was a lot of pushback about why that was happening and whether that's good or bad. You know, it's, I would again say, um, it's, it's complicated. It is good when we can start to kind of push the status quo with DOTs and we can get more support for long-term bicycle and pedestrian and really multimodal infrastructure. That in and of itself is a really good thing. And if you're convincing that NIMBY neighborhood that having more multimodal infrastructure is, is a good thing and they want it, that's not bad, but it, it gets to this issues of where it's happening, where we're distributing resources. If you're using a bicycle and pedestrian and multimodal plan that was already developed, with the community in mind and you're just able to implement it faster, but the community process and the community engagement was already done, that's a good thing. I think when you're only kind of trying to fit the needs of physical distancing in wealthy neighborhoods and not looking at the fact that really we, we before COVID uh, did not you know, have uh, 
equitable access to opportunity in transportation before, and you're just furthering that divide, that's a bad thing. Uh, we're seeing um, kind of, you know, sadly, but unsurprisingly, instantly playing out who, what races were most disproportionately impacted uh, by COVID-19 and it was our black communities and you know one of the one of not the only but one of the main contributing factors and we know this uh through our public health partners is that we've created vast uh health disparities based on race because of the built environment and how can we use this opportunity again that is something that we know that that really you can go on the cdc's website that is science that shows that the way that we have built our communities and the racist policies and practices uh, that we've have have created vast health disparities and we have an active role in fixing this so really although quick builds are about challenging the status quo building more support providing more access we have to remember it's couched in a much larger narrative um and so with that, that's really what, what I am seeing from the national perspective. I just, my contact information, but I'm so excited for you to hear from Mike and Warren. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Great. Okay, this, uh, can you go back a couple slides, please? Yeah, there we go. All right, uh, thank you, Emiko. So yeah, I'm excited to, to share some thoughts with you today. Um, you know, at, at Street Plans, we've been doing a lot of work around documenting, um, like Smart Growth America, um, what's been happening uh, across the United States and the globe, um, but also trying to really ascertain best practices and then expand those practices um, much further beyond where they are, you know, currently operating right now. And I think a lot of people would agree too that we're not moving; we haven't quite moved past this yet. There, there's a lot of interesting dynamics at play around who's moving towards recovery and who's seeing spikes, and that is very uneven across the country. And so these issues are not exactly uniform. Uh, next slide. So uh, tactical urbanism and the quick build methodology kind of go hand in glove. And it's something that we've worked to define and help cities um, understand and then move towards uh, enacting and then um, scaling a kind of programmatic or policy approach to thinking about project delivery in a different way. Um, so very quickly, when we think about a demonstration project, that is primarily something that is about public engagement. It's about something that's very momentary. It's about using the project itself as the platform to engage people on the street who might not otherwise ever attend a public meeting uh, for any variety of reasons, which is to say most people. Um, the materials tend to be very, very lightweight, 100% reversible, and you're talking about a few hundred dollars and maybe a block or two at most in terms of scale. Um, what we categorize as quick build really fall into this middle uh, two categories, which is the pilot project and the interim design. So say you have a master plan or a demonstration project um, that's been a success and you want to move forward with the actual recommendations that were contained therein. The pilot project is really a method to, um, to test that out with a more, you know, a clear timeline with thinking about issues like maintenance, thinking about partners and stewardship and about the design and engagement details that come with something that is, you know, using a materials that are robust enough to last for more than say a week, um, but are not so expensive that they can't be completely taken out, they can't be adapted, reversed, tweaked, changed, um, added on to, et cetera. And then interim design is really that next increment of investment that can be set in place before you have long-term capital to reconstruct your streets. And that's to say a condition that Sure, it can be one to five years, but as we know, in most communities, that might be just the state of your, most of your streets most of the time. So it's, more, it's slightly more robust, still technically reversible in a relatively easy manner, but the material cost and the intended duration is, is much longer than, say, um, the pilot project. So in between those two is what we categorize as the quick build methodology. So I want to put that out there um, just as a, as a definition. So next. We've seen this pivot during COVID um, to be more about response, which I think you could almost liken to a demonstration project, to then recovery. And like I said, recovery is looking different in every you know, community across the country, um, but it can draw upon that quick build toolkit to take what is cone, barrels, barricades, really your traffic control um, you know, material, materials, and it can evolve into that next increment. And the whole point of not moving so quickly beyond the response is one, should the response be kept in place? Because it, it itself can be a platform for engagement and feedback um, from street users and people in the community. Um, and if so, 
you know, how long should we commit to um, those types of changes? And then what kinds of changes should we make in terms of the location, the design, the materiality to service the, the needs of the community from a mobility uh, perspective um, long before you could get to a long-term capital reconstruction or, or rethinking for the, the more permanent state next. So Quickfield has adapted itself into a number of different interventions. I won't go into this at length, but you know, we've been documenting cities now since the middle of March who've used some sort of temporary response in the public right away. And it really does boil down to the six. I would say uh, streeteries or you know, closing portions or all of um, you know, commercial blocks with restaurants to outdoor dining is probably the most ascendant trend right now. Um, but it, it was interesting to see the conversation get so excited about open streets at the beginning, which historically has been a term applied to car-free streets um, that would happen, let's say, one day a year or one day a month for you know, six months um, in the warmer months of the year, and then feature really heavy community programming to engage people in all sorts of different conversations and opportunity around public health um, and mobility. Um, that term has now been applied broadly to all the things that you see here and, and other elements. Um, but the pushback that we saw, you know, after say a couple of weeks of communities really excitedly jumping onto open streets, usually in waterfronts or in you know large signature parks, um, was that this was not obviously meeting the needs of uh, um, of mobility around the community, and particularly for essential workers, uh, which is a really really important and valid critique. Next slide. Um, the scale which this is implemented kind of scales to the community or the region in which it's being applied, but I will just say in terms of the top 10 at the moment, the mileage in Paris is around 400 miles of temporary bike lanes that will be eventually made permanent, some of which are already on that, on that track. Um, Montreal, Lima, Vancouver, all the way down to Brussels, um, just under 75 miles of changes around the community. So these, you know, this includes Oakland as well, which you know, we'll hear about in a minute, but the scale of this is pretty large. Um, but where you see this scale, most of these places had some type of plan that was recently adopted or policy that included a level of engagement that gave politicians the confidence to try to move this forward quickly at this scale, which anyone can agree, particularly working in the city, is, is daunting, uh, if not impressive. Next. So uh, our work uh, from late April through just you know, uh, today and, and finishing up this week has been to work with NACTO closely on developing guidance for communities on how to think about these types of changes, you know, from design elements, materials, the policies, how to center equity and the approach and responses um, that communities are taking. Um, next slide. And focusing on some of these more common measures. Um, like I just described. And so these are these cut sheets that have been developed and we released about six of them um, three weeks ago, and, four weeks ago, I think now. And today I believe there'll be a new um, cut sheet release, which is called um, Streets for Protest or Protest Streets. So thinking about how guidance can be put in place around, um, yes, design, but more so the management and policy for uh, supporting and enabling the uh, protest activity we're seeing across the country. Next slide. Um, we'll have a whole new tranche of, I think it's seven or eight new cut sheets that also get released next week. And that gets into a lot more of the healthcare, the social service delivery, um, the, uh, the retailing, uh, schools, things like that, where we're really trying to expand the possibilities for what communities can do in providing you know, safe streets, sure, but also delivering services that are so needed in the most critical places at the moment and our streets become the really important and primary locations to do that. Next slide. Um, so you can follow this link, um, you know, to find the latest and greatest in terms of that spreadsheet that we're keeping. Next slide. Um, and I want to really kind of end on a couple points here. One is that uh, those early adaptations of open streets or slow streets or, um, you know, taking the curb lane for pick up and drop off. Um, really happened opportunistically and without a lot of communication or equity and thought um, as the focus. And I think what we've seen more communities take on in recent weeks is really thinking critically about where the needs are the greatest, improving the communication on the ground to um, let folks know why these changes are coming and being open to adapting them, removing them, extending them as communities respond to them. And I think, you know, Providence is a great example of that where they looked at where the people have the least access to open space, um, either through front yards or backyards, as well as the density, and then 
found streets right in the heart of those communities and looked to implement slow streets there so that people could use the outdoor space safely and to both move throughout the community, but to also be outdoors where there's a lack of park space or personal um, outdoor space as well. Next slide. So adapting that is really what's coming and you know, whether this is recovery or this is response, um, I think is an open question. And, and by that, I mean, you know, the example here from Boston is that you, know, you see the kind of the cones there delineating a bus lane. Um, this is a pre-COVID project. This is not something that's, you know, that was done super recently, but it's using that same kind of material toolkit and response around mobility and the bus system. Um, now, some communities are now thinking that we're in the recovery mode, so what are we gonna do work on next or what's gonna be important? Uh, in my mind, that is very much transit. And I think if there's one thing that's been left out of the responses at a national scale, it's been buses and the need to move people safely to you know, provide distancing within buses, which means higher frequency buses and moving buses efficiently through bus lanes and other improvements is something that again, has not been part of the responses in any, most cities across the United States. And that's very problematic when you look at a, a lot of essential workers and folks in communities without cars actually move around the region. In fact, quite the opposite is happening. Instead of expanding access to transit, we're seeing cuts happen across the board and that's very troubling given the equity role and the mobility role that buses play in, in cities across America. Um, in two cities I've seen positive progress and probably there's been more, but the two that I've documented, New York and Boston, you know, Boston's done a couple of quick installations of expanding either bus stops or adding in new bus lanes. There you see Washington Street in downtown Boston. And this was something that was actually piloted with the Bar Foundation and BTD and other supporters relatively recently. So it was kind of a natural candidate to go from the cones into the, the red carpet, so to speak. And so communities who have this muscle they can flex can utilize that approach to kind of take that next increment. Um, but I want to end by, the, end by saying that the response that we're, communities are having, um, you know, we may be going backwards. Uh, we may be going back to this, you know, we need to be in recovery mode, fighting the expansion of the pandemic and we really need to think if we go back in that direction and we're in a more of an emergency state, that again, the role of the bus is gonna be critical in, in that and not to overlook it. Next slide. And so what's important right now, I think we've seen a lot of really powerful images around um, the protests for George Floyd and Brianna and many others that we've seen a kind of convergence of the tactics, let's say, or the quick build type projects um, and methods with activism. And sometimes that's in support and in alignment, like when you see the Black Lives Matter Plaza in DC and across cities, you know, across the, the country and the globe, or it appears in conflict, right? Where on the upper right-hand corner, you had this image that kind of made its way around the globe with people um, dining in these outdoor patio spaces in Cincinnati while people march by and protest. And it kind of brings up this question of like, who are these changes for? Why are we doing this now when we have more important issues to either be discussing or mobilizing for and, um, and, and you know, what is the role of quick build at this moment? Um, and those are very valid you know, questions and it's gonna be a really uh, good conversation to have with this panel and of course, moving forward as we think to adapt and support communities with what they need and when they need it um, moving forward you know, into response and recovery. So I think with that, that's my last slide and I'll turn it over, thanks. Great. Well, I think no one here is better prepared to talk about <laughs> exactly what all of those different uh, images that were on your last slide um, mean for implementation. So I'm going to turn it over to Warren to talk about what's going on in Oakland. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you both Emiko and Michael for uh, stealing some of my talking points. So I'll try and get ahead. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Warren Logan. I'm the Mayor's Policy Director of Mobility and Interagency Relations for the City of Oakland. And um, I'm really happy to talk with all of you about kind of what is Slow Streets and, and also what it is not. Um, two months ago, Oakland, Oakland's mayor announced that we were going to close all 74 miles of the city's adopted neighborhood bikeways to, um, to all through traffic. And that's, that's a term of art that I'll talk about later um, as a way to increase social distancing and reduce the potential for conflicts and ultimately collisions um, in our neighborhood streets. And the 74 miles that we chose were the adopted 74 miles from our 2019 bicycle master plan. So just as both Emiko and Michael talked about, we had done the homework, you know, for the year beforehand, very coincidentally, I suppose, and received, you know, over 2,500 different 
um, people responding and engaging with that program. Our team went to nearly every event across the city, attended community meetings, neighborhood councils, to really have a rich, robust conversation about what it meant to have safe streets in their community. And a lot of folks said, you know, we don't really like bike lanes, we don't like protected bikeways, but I'd like to be able to walk safely in my neighborhood. I'd like to feel calm in my neighborhood. And that's really the backbone of what our neighborhood bikeways were about. So I'm gonna hold that here for a second. Um, what the rollout has looked like though, is that even though there's 74 miles of paper closure, we decided as a department and as a city to start rolling out what are called sock closures, which are the barricades that you can Google and see on Twitter um, around about 30 different miles of streets. It's where major arterials meet the slow street. So we are actively discouraging people from turning from a fast street to a slow street, which is in fact borne out by our data from our um, high injury network where most of the collisions are occurring. So we've done sort of this hotspot analysis on top of the community engagement. Um, in addition, and I saw a couple of you ask about this in the chat thread already, we uploaded all of those streets to Google Ways and Apple Maps. So if you're driving in Oakland, you will actively be routed away from any one of those streets. And if you place a destination on that street, it actually won't get you all the way there. It'll get you almost there and then you kind of have to figure it out, um, which is kind of awesome because all of the different um, mobility services and delivery companies use one of those two mapping platforms. So it's a way to actively push, you know, through traffic out of, um, you know, sensitive communities. I want to talk a little bit about the feedback that we've received, because I think this is primarily what all of us are going to be focusing on. Um, I think that all of the, you know, Twitterati and, you know, like urbanist culture was really excited about you know, our announcement. And at the time, you know, kind of going to Mike's, you know, slide, we were at the time like the most miles. And that was really exciting for like our brief second before people out competed us. Um, and so a lot of people were really enthusiastic about the potential for street closures and what that meant for, you know, safe roads. And I think that that's fantastic. On the other hand, though, and I want to be really honest about this, we had a lot of pushback, primarily from our communities of color, in deep East Oakland. And I, I want to spend just a moment talking about the feedback that we received because it's, I think this is the part that I really want to hone in on today. Several people called me at my office and said, are you tricking black people into going outside to get sick for COVID-19? And that really hit me because it was like, no, that's not the goal at all. But it also meant that there was a really big messaging issue where we're telling people to shelter in place and also go outside and walk the dog. And that's a really complicated message. The other part though, and I, this, I think this speaks to the way that people in general understand the government as a, as a big organized block instead of individual nearly siloed organizations that operate loosely connected. Many people called us and said, why is this the city's initiative right now? Shouldn't we be focused on testing? And the irony of course is that I actually am in our emergency response team managing the testing program. So that gave me a lot of ideas to move forward with. Um, I think the other part though, and this kind of gets to the, the inequity throughout the city and probably most cities that you represent, is that a lot of people in deep East Oakland said, we don't have time to recreate with our kids. We're the essential workers that are trying to get to work because we're not allowed to shelter in place. And again, that really hit because it was like, okay, I think we've missed the mark for a lot of people who we should be prioritizing and helping during this time. Um, based on that feedback, our, our approach to slow streets has shifted a little bit. The first of which is that nearly just a week later, after people had said, we need information about testing and about community resources, we used all of the barricades and all of those, you know, 30 miles of roadway and put on all of the community resources on those signs. So um, again, you can just Google this, it's all over the internet. There are plenty of pictures of like, here's where you can get a free COVID-19 test on the signage for the slow streets. We were trying to kind of connect people and essentially use them as, as small billboards to get the, the message out. Um, the second was that based on a lot of our rich engagement with neighborhood stakeholders in DP Stokeland, they said, we would rather you focus on what we would all call arterial crossings to essential places, to community resources, instead of the neighborhood routes. And so what we've shifted to, and I think you know, we, we have a couple rolling out later this week, so look forward to that, is that we've applied the quick build process to 
these, these arterials where, again, the slow streets meet a crossing to you know, a clinic, a health clinic, or to a grocery store. And we've received a lot of positive feedback about that. The next aspect, and this is um, a little bit more work that we're excited to be doing, is partnering with our Department of Race and Equity and our Department of Violence Prevent Crime and Violence Prevention, excuse me, to talk about how to program slow streets as a way to refocus activity in community neighborhoods towards the types of activities that people are really looking for in their communities. Um, maybe I'll wrap up here, which is to say, slow streets is a short-term response to COVID-19 to provide physical distancing and ideally to reduce pressure on our hospitals from collisions related to, or excuse me, from injuries related to collisions. Um, and I think also people have asked, you know, what's, what's a major lesson learned from this slow streets application is that I think we as, you know, transportation experts, et cetera, we need to be thinking strategically about whether or not we need to spend three years talking about doing something important or three weeks to just try something. Um, I'm also going to be kind of critical here for a second and say what slow streets is not. Um, and for starters, I think to sort of use Michael's point, slow streets is not really a recovery tool. It's, it's, it's not. I think it's, it's going to get us there, but it, it's not a pathway towards economic recovery in the way that I think people are really looking for. And to be blunt, slow streets is also not police reform. Like, I'm going to say that again. Slow streets is not police reform. And that's really what the world is talking about right now. And it is not racial justice, which is also what we're talking about today. Um, and perhaps even more specifically, it is not really deep investment, economic investment in communities of color that were redlined and you know, continue to be disinvested in ever since. So like, let's be really clear about what slow streets are, right? what tactical urbanism is, and all of the other challenges that are intersecting with these issues. Um, slow streets is also not a good representation of people of color. And I, Mike, this is not against you, but it's against Planet is in. I challenge all of you to Google the 100 influential urbanists and you will find exactly one black person and it's Rosa Parks. And Rosa Parks is fantastic, but I also want to explain that all of these things, even though they might not seem related to tactical urbanism and to slow streets are the kinds of feedback that we're receiving and understandably so from our communities of color, our low-income communities that are saying, I'm so excited that you're excited about slow streets, but it would be great if you could focus on affordable housing and job creation. So I just, I want to lift that up in this moment to say that, um, that there are lots of tools in the toolbox, and this is one of them, but it is not, um, as the zinger that I found in, in, while I was showering this morning, slow streets is a silver lining. It is not a silver bullet. So um, with that, I'm excited to continue our panel and, and talk with all of you. Well, that was a fantastic opener from each of you. And we're actually at 1240 and I wanna make sure that we can field some questions from the audience. Um, but I am gonna start with one that I, I see in the question box um, and was hit on by all three speakers and it has to do with quickness and inclusiveness. Um, and I, I kind of couch this as a question to Warren, but I think all of you have implemented these um, different projects, but it, it's really fair to say that these slow streets, you know, 30 miles, 74 miles, you know, overnight into a pilot or demonstration project um, using, you know, short-term materials, uh, is fairly unprecedented and before being in Oakland you were in you were in San Francisco where you know we've been talking about like a, a subway system since the 1990s that's like just you know being built now um, so this is like a totally different timeline um, than anything we've seen before meanwhile it occurs during this moment where where we're talking about making significant change um, and leaps and bounds that in conditions for our black and brown communities. Um, and, and so it's sort of like a read the room kind of issue. It becomes this sort of like stark contrast to the real problems um, being faced uh, by many of the people most at risk. Um, so, so my question really is like, and I think this speaks to silver lining, but how do we get that balance of like moving quickly in, in, in bureaucracy and responding to need quickly is a good thing. Um, and how do we think about that in, in terms of equity? And I'll, I'll leave that as a, a, an open question to the panel. 
maybe I'll kick us off um, and talk a little bit about our process because I, I totally respect the feedback that even you're sharing right now, Rachel, which is like, move quickly, try new things, also don't lose the people who you're trying to help. Uh, we have weekly calls, like a standing meeting with all of the advocates that represent DP Stokeland every single week. And what's kind of exciting about it is that while it initially started as, a, frankly, a shouting match about how we've, you know, failed them, um, which I'll, I'll own, right? Like we pissed off a lot of people when we launched um, Slow Streets, and I'm going to be honest about that. Um, it also gave us a window into having a conversation about like what is actually possible and then what can be changed. Because at the end of the day, and I've, I've said this a number of times, I'm almost disappointed that the city of Oakland made headlines for putting a few barricades in neighborhood streets. If you look at the map, the network of seven, you know, the 74 miles of slow streets, these are also not streets you'd really want to drive on in the first place. You know, our, our, we have two grids that sort of link up in the middle of, of the city, but a lot of the streets are offset so that they don't meet at, you know, perpendicular angles, right? So if you look at the slow street network, just naturally, you wouldn't really want to drive through them for very long distances. So it's kind of a sleight of hand to say, don't drive on streets we don't want you driving on and you don't want to drive on either, right? Like that's also what slow streets is. It's just reminding people that they should have access to safety. The other consideration though about equity is that I think that we've highlighted again though that we can move quickly. And so if slow streets isn't working, please tell us what is, right? Like this is my, you know, treatise to everyone. Con like please provide constructive criticism. If the barricades aren't working, we can change them, right? If they're in the wrong spot, we can move them, right? But I'm not willing, and I've, I've said this like a hundred times, I'm not willing to spend my entire time in the mayor's office talking about doing something when I've gone to, I think, five funerals for moms crossing their kids across the street outside of picking up their kids from school, right? Like, I'm not really planning on doing that anymore. And I'm just going to be like really raw and honest about that. So while slow streets might not be exactly the right fit, I'm also interested in moving quickly to save lives. And like, I'm trying to intersect that with keeping people informed, engaging with them and recognizing that there is a very real like trauma that people are experiencing every day when people get hit. Um, and we need to be doing something about that. And we need to respond to it like the emergency that it really is similar to COVID and several other issues that we're all grappling with right now. Yeah, and one of the places that was mentioned as like a focus area for tactical urbanism or quick build or piloting projects is around transit and its role with essential workers and, and making sure that they're getting to and from work safely. And I have a question from Brianna Lovell here. She says, it was mentioned that transit projects have largely been left out of the conversation to date. I'm curious if Warren and others have heard more from community members about the needs for transit riders and whether any cities or agencies are responding to meet this need. There are still 120,000 people riding King County Metro every day right now, which dwarfs the number of people recreating on foot and bike. Yes, <laughs> uh, we're, we are in, and I, I kind of mentioned this in my intro is that if there's going to be a le like anything permanent from slow streets, it's the lessons learned that we can move fast and try things quickly. And so I actually contacted our transit provider here, AC Transit, and said, do you all have any hotspots where you have delays? And can we try out, a, you know, not slow streets, because obviously we're trying to speed up the bus, but, you know, how do we speed up the bus and provide better access to transit in a very, very quick way? Like, do I need to go buy a thousand orange cones and put them next to bus stops? That's something that is now on the table. And so I think that it's kind of a Pandora's box to say, if you could do that so quickly, why didn't you try this just as quickly? And I think that's the really exciting part about this movement. And my yeah, um, I would weigh in to say that, that I think a lot of that, and, and Warren's really touched on this, is being clear about what you are and are not trying to do with your slow streets or quick builds. Um, you know, whether people realized it or not, what they were trying to do with most of the initial quick builds or open streets or, or slow streets were provide space for physical distancing. And that meets a certain set of needs. Um, and ideas of access, like if we cared as much about accessibility and getting people uh, who cannot or uh, who are not able to uh, afford to maintain a car um, or don't want to, it's a different, you're, you're, 
you essentially have a different goal you're working towards. And so I think it's being really clear about that. And unfortunately, the needs of transit users has never been, you know, a huge national or local priority. And we're seeing that right now in how we had to rush. Um, and I can credit my colleagues at Transportation for America to make sure that we got um, any money, operating money for transit within the CARES Act. Um, frankly, the federal government is completely failing in providing guidance um, or protection or funding to our transit agencies. And I think it's clear about the priorities. This one's complicated. Transit is a really complicated one that I think goes beyond quick builds because the role of quick builds intersecting with transit is getting safe access. The problem is transit agencies, even the best of them, have to cut service because their operating funds are down. And that because we have shitty land use in this country, uh, whether you're in a more urbanized area in a suburban or rural area, you're talking about covering large distances that quick builds aren't necessarily going to solve. So it gets really complicated. And I think, you know, if, if there's a commitment to actually getting people around in transit, then the, you know, city leaders have to say that is our goal. And it, it requires a lot more than quick builds. And frankly, I think, you know, this again gets to, we're waiting. I mean, the federal guidance and federal support around this has been crickets or getting your cars don't take transit. And, and I think this is where it's all intersecting, but what quick builds, what slow streets are and aren't, and what the goalposts are actually trying to achieve is. But Emiko, I'm gonna add to that point really quickly and talk just for a second about all of the background that, it, you know, the, the bodies that it took to deploy quick build, right? To deploy slow streets. It wasn't like three people put out, you know, barricades and that was the day. Like a lot of people touched this program. Quick shout out to my amazing safety team at DOT who is doing all the work. And I'm like Jerry from cheer, like cheering them on. So let's be clear. I'm just cheering them on here. Um, I hope you watch cheer, by the way. Uh, one of the things that's really important to know is that most cities that you probably all represent during an emergency or a crisis, um, we set up what's called an emergency operations center for that crisis. And what happens is that we pull out all of the important, you know, major leaders and stakeholders from every department and create like, not a shadow government, but like its own separate entity that is able to focus on that, on that emergency. And they're given extra authority by the council to just do their job. And so what's cool about slow streets and by extension COVID-19, which is awful in a way, is that if we treat things that are emergencies like actual emergencies and we vest power in the people that are able to make those decisions and give them you know, enough runway, we are in fact able to address other issues like land use, affordable housing, job creation. It's that we don't give those tools to the people who are able to um, enact those policies as quickly as we want. And I just want to, I want to point that out. Like we are in fact capable of moving quickly. We choose not to. Yes. And I think, um, Mike, we had talked about this a little bit on the call. We also have a, a question from Julian Sabula in Salt Lake City. Our slow streets are one of the most popular initiatives we've ever undertaken. That's super interesting. Um, but we need to dismantle them largely due to lack of resources. Has anyone been successful empowering residents to improve safety on their streets with quick build projects? I know, Mike, you have some thoughts on resources. Emiko, you might too, and you kind of spoke to it. And um, I think resources are, are, are a big uh, component of this idea of like how fast can we move and what gets prioritized. So go ahead and, and let's talk about that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of cities, you know, only have installed so much because they don't have the people power or they literally don't have the actual materials on hand. You know, most cities don't necessarily have a huge warehouse full of cones and barricades and signs. Actually, a lot of that stuff has had to be ordered. You know, budgets are being slashed. It's been a really tough time to be in Warren shoes or DOT or public works shoes because people are out sick. You know, the materials are on hand. You've got a swelling voice of people who want these changes or are demanding them or have seen them in other cities. And that pressure has been really intense on, on communities. And I think for me, what this uh, underscores is that if you can get to the point where maybe Oakland is now and they feel like they have confidence and they can move quickly on you know, really important issues and learn from them on the fly, um, that's a really important skill set to have to apply to all these other issues that governments touch and deal with. Um, if you don't have that experience, you don't have that kind of programmatic or you know, policy muscle to flex in a crisis, then you're gonna really struggle to overcome the, the challenges. And 
to just put it really clearly, like a city that like a Bogota, for example, when they first saw the pandemic starting to bear down on, on their city, um, they were able to really quickly just say, hey, every Sunday we do this thing where we shut down 120 kilometers of streets and it touches all these different neighborhoods and all different strata of life. We can just use that, but not be Sundays, but be every day. And then they did a huge amount of quick evaluation. They got feedback from people and the network has just morphed over the last several um, months as they've learned where people are coming from. They learned they had to put the bikeways more to the edge of the city because people are now cycling and avoiding the BRT system. So in any event, like having that capability, that capacity, that knowledge amongst different uh, departments on who does what and how, if you haven't built that before, it's really, really hard in a pandemic to try and then move that forward. So I think that's the critical lesson is, and it shouldn't just be applied to our streets, it shouldn't just be applied to public space, it should be applied through all these things that we see as emergencies. Um, so I think this would be really interesting to see in the coming weeks, months, and years, how cities tackle things like police reform. And you saw Minneapolis move super quickly on announcing that they were gonna dismantle and restructure the entire thing around public safety. That's, that's using a quick build like muscle or impetus to try something big and structural that needs to change. And I think that's the, the big takeaway that I've had from all this observation and, and work and knowledge and hearing from people around the globe is that that's been a really critical piece of it. Yeah, I think you're also mentioning like there's a resiliency to getting it wrong that needs to be developed by um, cities so that they're more willing to try things and, and the, the, for the public to get used to saying, hey, I don't really like it like this. Um, I'd rather it like that. Um, and learning how to articulate transportation needs in a way where that's a little bit more experiential. And I think Warren, you had a great example of this in East Oakland, if you wanna share a little bit about um, communicating with stakeholders and the experiential learning opportunity of Quick Build. Totally, and it's, it's, I'm actually gonna to touch on one of the things that you said just a second ago, which is that I think that it is a privilege to understand how to communicate with government. Like, and I think that that's something that doesn't quite, and I've, I, I'm still learning this myself, like, so, I, so I'm not gonna pretend like I have this perfectly, right? But one of the things that Rachel and I have been texting back and forth throughout like the saga of the last two months was that initially when we reached out to, and, and they reached out to us, the, the East Oakland stakeholders, A, they were furious and understandably so. And B, they were like, get rid of this, take it back, we're done. And it took a lot of like digging to really understand like what they're actually saying. And I, I hopped on a number of Zoom calls and I kind of just like, was like, okay, let me make sure I understand you correctly. Sort of the active listening stance, right? You're saying to me, take away the makeshift barricades from your streets called slow streets, and I'm gonna keep them in all of the wealthy white communities because they told me to keep them. Is that what you're telling me to do, right? Like just, and they're like, wait, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, I don't like these barricades because they're triggering, because incidentally, and this is something we as transportation planners need to work on, we are not even done with our bus rapid transit line running through all of East Oakland that has like ripped through the city. And while on one hand, I'm very excited that we're gonna have a bus rapid transit line, I am frustrated that everyone is pissed off about it because it's like construction is happening nonstop. And so the connection here is that the community members were telling us get rid of the barricades, not just because they didn't like slow streets, but because the barricades reminded them of this like force of construction and really unmitigated construction that has like hit them over and over and over again. So it turns out we'd said, okay, well, what do you want? And they're like, oh, just put planters there, right? Like put art there. Please showcase the history of our community in this location. It's not that we don't want you to slow traffic down. Duh, of course we do. But like call us first and make sure it's pretty. So it's kind of interesting to have like gotten to that really, really deep conversation. But again, I'm going to repeat myself. It is a privilege to understand how to communicate with the government, right? Like we're very good at siloing the kind of responses that we're looking for. And if we don't get the A or B response we're looking for, we immediately offload any of that information without asking the, the intersection. I asked you about this and you told me this completely different thing. Why did you bring this up when I wouldn't have expected that? That is actually the work we should be doing. It's, it's almost like therapy. Like tell me how you feel and why did you make that connection so that I can understand how to help you? That's like, that's the, the lesson learned. And I think it's a great lesson. It's one that, you know, it's incumbent upon the city of Oakland and every city around the country to not just put into place like the demonstration 
you know, response mechanism, but the whole palette, right? So there's a mechanism to go from the cone to the planter and the planter to the, you know, the, the, the swale, right? Or the green infrastructure, the real tree that comes in. Like we need to think about it as a mechanism for, as a methodology where all the pieces are put into play and can be applied when they're most effective, relevant and asked for. And that's something that I see very few cities doing is actually putting that suite into play and then be able to follow through um, and continue the engagement and the conversations with communities, not just, do you want it here or there? And then we leave and maybe we, we take it away later, but what comes next, how it comes and making sure that the budgets and the processes back that up. And if, if that's what could happen, if that's the potential of this you know, methodology in the United States, we're still very much in our infancy. And it's very different to look at Europe uh, and the changes that are happening there where they, they skipped a lot of the times, they skipped the cones, they skipped the barricades, and they've gone into saying, look, this is going to be interim, but it's all going to be made permanent and we're going to be laying cobbled, you know, within six months time and make it like hardened. And that's a very different conversation, but it's, it's where they're at and we're in a very different kind of system. So we need to think about that incremental process and, and build the trust through it. And um, that's something we're not doing yet. I have a quick question there, which is, um, and this might be my own ignorance, but it seems to me as though DOTs have some access to general funds in which to kind of experiment where um, transit agencies in many ways are, are going after big projects to roll them out. So when it comes to tactical urbanism and this need for maybe bus rapid transit or at least rapid prioritization. Um, have you anything to share with, I know we probably have some transit agencies on here, we have DOTs, any, any experience with the two working together on a, on a tactical project? Yeah, there's oh. dozens of examples. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Mike, and then I wanted to make another point. No, I was just going to say, we, we just released a report with TRB in, in late 2019 that is a kind of best practice collection of both how advocacy organizations, cities, and transit agencies have worked together to build, um, you know, to fast track uh, BRT and other bus improvements. I'll stop there. Uh, I know we've only got a few minutes left, Rachel. And one of the points I wanted, I would be remiss in making, um, which is on topic and then very a little off topic, but when you're talking about funding and I think when we're, when I think about the cities that have been able to, to do quick builds or tactile urbanism, a lot of it comes from political leadership but also the ability to have funding. And I think that's a big part of it. And um, I would be remiss without mentioning that last week the, at the Congress, um, the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee released its um, version of the next reauthorization of the transportation bill. And when we talk about how the fact that our built environment was built you know, with really racist policies in mind. I think we need to remember that there is still very much a federal role in this because often fights that cities are having, even cities with strong leaders that want to do the right things are with state DOTs that take direction from the feds. And that there's a part of it just linking this, because we're talking about a little thing, which is quick builds, but linking it with like very large, you know, kind of larger billion dollar decisions that are being made as we speak. They're doing markups starting tomorrow. Uh, yes, tomorrow's Wednesday. Um, when yes, billions of dollars, <laughs> I know. I know, but but that it's all related, and and that we need to remember that that all of this also takes strong political leadership, but also. Um, remembering that all of this funding is, you know, most of this funding is coming from the feds, um, unless, you know, your city has been able to pass or your state a voter approved levy or tax measure, which has definite equity implications within it. They're often regressive and, and more often in more progressive, wealthier cities. Uh, that, that's just all part of it that I always want to like remember to lead people on is while we're talking about interventions on quick builds, there are billion dollar decisions that, that our elected leaders are making in DC right now. I've been spending time where I'm not on this, actually working on amendments and doing all this. And we have to remember that the root of this is some very racist federal policies and very car centric, very speed centric, and that, and that we need to just, you know, that's going on kind of with all of this and that we're not going to, we can make incremental change without, but that we really need to get to the heart of where this all is happening. And that's in DC um, over on Capitol Hill. Okay, can I jump in really quickly? I know we're almost out of time. Emiko, I'm gonna call bullshit, which is that, excuse me, which is that 
like we, I asked my DOT to calculate how much it would cost to like roll out our entire slow street network with planters. And it was less than a million dollars. So like, why is it that we always find money for like the big things when like simple stuff is really cheap and we're like, oh, let's just jump over this, yeah. right? Like I just don't, I, I'm calling bullshit, which is that yes, there is obviously some federal policy that needs to be fixed. Like I'm not gonna handle, like I don't have the mental fortitude for that right now. But my DOT, right, like the city of Oakland does have control over our streets in a way that we could just, like if we moved money over, right, like there is a bicycle um, protected bikeway network that we're trying to build out as well. And just one section is like $14 million. And don't get me wrong, I'm very excited about it. And it's a transformative project. But that same amount of money could like roll out the slow streets 14 times. So like which one has the bigger impact? Well, I think it's a yes and. And, and I, like, cut us off. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> well, I think it's a yes and. And I wanted to also say that Massachusetts just announced a $5 million funding program for quick launch, quick build projects called Safer Streets and Space. And so states are too also realizing this. And I think to Warren's point, a lot can be done with very little when it comes to quick build, but I think it's all of the above. And, you know, I mean, if we were to be able to reduce speeds and not have infrastructure that was you know, billions of dollars going into increased speeds and, incre you know, projects that are engineered to harm us um, or in incentivizing state DOTs to submit projects that might increase congestion, increase speeds, um, you know, we would be looking at things really differently. So it's a, to me, it's a, it's all, all of the above, but I love a spicy retort. Um, <laughs> And um, with that, this is recorded. We'll be sharing it. Um, if you want to um, follow up on our June 24th event uh, with John Percari, former Deputy Secretary of USDOT, about positioning your projects, um, join Transpo Talk. Uh, the link is in the chat. And I really thank all of my speakers for being here today. That was so wonderful. Um, anytime you guys, you know, want to do lunch, do a brown bag, I'm down. <laughs> you're all brilliant. Keep doing the work that you're doing. It's so important. Uh, thank you so much.